Empire State Plaza, known to residents as the South Mall, may well be what Nelson A. Rockefeller set out to create, the most electrifying capital in the world. Certainly, as an office complex for state employees, it is one of the most spectacular. This is what Albany's waterfront looked like half a century ago. Rockefeller came to Albany in 1959 as governor of New York State. He saw a city that was a far cry from the skyscrapers he had been accustomed to seeing on the same Hudson River, 150 miles below. In 1928, when the state office building was erected on the top of State Street Hill, the city had, for the first time, what might be called a skyline. Although, as a deep water port, it had always had an interesting waterfront. The Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception, seat of the Roman Catholic Diocese, was completed in 1853 and was the center of a pleasant residential neighborhood which was beginning to show signs of age. The Catholic Union, housing a lending library, a gymnasium, and a ballroom, which became the Eagle Theater when movies were cheap entertainment, had been for many years a social center for the diocese and was a landmark on Eagle Street at Hudson Avenue. The convent of the Sisters of St. Joseph was home for the nuns who staffed the Cathedral Academy a school which has educated thousands of Albany's children since 1861. Half a mile to the north, the state capital reminds one of a French chateau, a strange choice of architecture for a Dutch city, symbolized by hundreds of tulips which enhance the park in the spring. As a member of one of the wealthiest and most powerful families in the world, it was not surprising that Governor Rockefeller found his new home and his surroundings on Eagle Street to be less than satisfactory. An official visit from Princess Beatrix of the Netherlands embarrassed the Republican governor, as well as Democratic Mayor Corning. The mayor, annoyed that the city was losing workers to a state office campus three miles away, realized that something must be done to get the workers back downtown. On March 27, 1962, the bombshell burst. The state had bought 40 blocks in the heart of Albany for $20 million. In a few months, signs in the South End indicated the impending changes. Among the old brown stones on Hamilton Street, the Church of the Assumption, built in 1892 to serve the French-speaking Catholics, was one of four churches in the proposed mall area which would be torn down. On June 30th, 1963, the last mass was offered and the congregation, once numbering 500, but now reduced by the removal of families to less than 100, came for a last blessing in the church which they loved. It was the end of an era in this part of the city. It wasn't long before barriers appeared in several areas as some of the more decrepit buildings were demolished. In 
dynamite was needed to bring down the more substantial dwelling. Downtown, some of the old crumbling walls went down easily. These astute business leaders had settled financial arrangements with the state early and could have the properties taken off the tax roll. There was dust and rubbish everywhere. Glimpses of familiar buildings kept one oriented during the beginning stages of the project. St. Paul's Episcopal Church was slated for demolition. Ironically, this dated Victorian row was to be spared. Education would not be disrupted. The Cardinal McCluskey High School began rebuilding in another part of the city to replace a five-year-old school being destroyed. Only a few blocks from its original location, a new cathedral academy was built on Park Avenue to provide for the elementary pupils. The cornerstone was laid in 1967, long before the completion of the mall. The promise of the mall was magnificent. The reality discouraging. 98 acres of devastation, dust and debris looked more like the aftermath of war than urban renewal. Violent legal and political wrangling had been in evidence from the outset concerning the feasibility and value of this grandiose project. 6,800 residents and 350 small businesses had been displaced with no housing planned for their relocation and it seemed no concern for their future. Only the children found any joy in the project at this stage of its development. When the dust cleared after a couple of years, new perspectives of old landmarks emerged. Original plans had projected completion of the mall by 1970, but this was not to be. Before construction could get underway, three million cubic yards of mud and clay had to be dug out and carted away to dumping grounds. It added tremendously to the cost to make sure of solid ground in this river valley, which was all mud and sand. Day and night, the sound of the hammer could be heard throughout the city. Construction finally went forward on several of the 10 buildings simultaneously. And for a time, there was nothing visible above street levels since much of the work was going on five or six stories below. Although hampered by a variety of mishaps, two serious fires, and a water main break which sent tons of water into the excavation, the steel work progressed. Still on its site in 1968, 
the bishop's residence awaited the wreckers ball. In July of 68, the tower building was beginning to stand out among the other structures which were in progress along Swan Street. This 42-story, nine-sided building will rise 589 feet above the platform. It will be the loftiest structure of them all, as well as the tallest building in the state outside of Manhattan. More than 3,000 employees will work here in the tower, which will house the Office of General Services and the Health Department. From across the river, the cathedral spires are insignificant now, and even the 34-story state office building seems small. A new bridge was designed to connect an arterial roadway through the mall with the counties to the east and south. The old Dunn Memorial Bridge, connecting Albany and Rensselaer, would be removed when the new structure was finished. In 1971, the exterior of the tower was completed and steel work for the Cultural Education Center was in progress. The center is behind the cathedral and faces the plaza. Constructing the last and most startling building of the complex was a feat in itself and almost defies description. A few of the operations pictured here give some idea of the size of a structure which will house two auditoriums, one seating about 950, the other about 500, on either side of a building whose cylindrical walls curve outward to form a bowl. Massive steel reinforcing rods bound together in the manner of barrel staves are prepared for the welders. Mixed concrete was delivered in enormous quantities, required to ensure that it would be 14 inches thick at the rim and 54 inches thick at the bottom of the bowl. Seen from the outside, it is about 10 stories high and is appropriately nicknamed the egg. Since the completion of the plaza, the platform is one of the busiest areas of the entire complex. Its fountains, reflecting pools, and broad promenades attract residents of the city as well as visitors from around the world. Ethnic Day is only one of the many events that make use of the plaza as a stage for recreational and cultural activities. One can experience a world tour by visiting the booths arranged around the promenade. 
sampling the foods foreign to the taste, which some people are reluctant to try, but who, with some friendly persuasion, finally give in. a great deal of time seeking a souvenir from some far off land they may have visited at some time or other. Though the years that went into the making of the mall were often painful, especially for longtime residents who had seen their homes, their schools, and their churches obliterated to satisfy the ego of one man, today they are proud of what they once called Rocky's Folly but which has transformed a 300-year-old Dutch town into the most spectacular capital in the country. With the first celebration of the 4th of July in 1978, this holiday event has become a tradition. Every year since, 40,000 people celebrate the 4th on the billion-dollar Nelson A. Rockefeller Empire State Plaza.